All right. Now, these are two that I'm going to use this in the message tonight. This dear sister right here, such a sad case. But listen to this. Dear, uh, good evening, Pastor Lawson. I enjoyed your sermon Wednesday night on Job's faithfulness to God. It was very encouraging. Now listen carefully. I have been a born-again Christian for two years now, but recently I have come under great distress. There was a time when I just depended on the finished work of Jesus Christ for my salvation. Now I am depending on my obedience to God so that I can be forward slash stay saved. And I don't know how to escape from it. It has taken away my assurance and put me in great despair. How do I get back to just trusting what Jesus did on the cross to save me? I look forward to hearing from you, your brother in Christ, and I'm not going to mention his name, from Alexandria, Virginia. So what would you say to him? That's what this message is going to be about tonight. Turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. And I hope he's watching. Deuteronomy chapter 25 and verse 1. I want to talk to you tonight about the doctrine of justification. Justification. Justification has to do with your relationship with God. It has everything to do with your relationship with God. Notice carefully how it's done. Deuteronomy 25, verse 1. If there be a controversy between men, and they come into judgment, that the judges may judge them, then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. Father, I pray that you bless your holy word now as it goes forth. And give me the, the gift of teaching and preaching tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I want you to notice what Deuteronomy chapter number 25, verse number 1 says. They will either declare the man just or they'll declare him condemned. Justification is something that comes by a declaration. God declares you to be just. It's not that you're perfect and it's not that you're sinless. It is a legal declaration that allows him to have a relationship with you built upon something. Now, what's it built upon? That's the issue. But it is a legal declaration that allows God to have a relationship with you that is based on something. Now, it's based on something that is much higher than you and much higher than me. To be just before God, God must declare you to be just. Romans chapter number 4, verses 2 through 8 says, For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory but not before God. In plain words, if he was justified by works, he would be glorying about it, but he couldn't do it before God. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, now note carefully, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Did you get that? You cannot separate righteousness and justification. You can't have either one without both. Amen. They don't exist. Well, then how can a man be righteous? I must live a sinless, perfect life in order to be righteous. You are righteous the same way you're justified. And this is what the Apostle is telling us here in Romans, verse 6. Even as David also described the blessedness of the man, unto whom God imputeth righteousness without works. See this? He imputeth righteousness without works, saying, Blessed are they whose iniquities are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. Notice the sins are covered, the iniquities are forgiven. He's justified and made righteous, not by what he does, by what God says. That's important. Because this gentleman tonight that I read to you just a moment ago, he says, Now I am depending on my obedience to God so that I can be, and then forward slash, stay saved. And there's an awful lot of people out there like that, folks. 
The fact of the matter is we've got a word for that. It's called Arminian. <coughs> and uh, the Arminian is the one who believes that you must live a sinless life, or at least the best you can do toward living a sinless life in order to keep your salvation and then appear before God. We'll get into how this works because it's important to understand how it works. The key to understanding our relationship with God is to understand a simple truth. And if we ever get that simple truth, all the rest of this will fall in place. The Bible says in the book of Psalm, chapter number 32, verse 2, Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. Now, did it say, blessed is the man who lives a perfect life before the Lord? Or blessed is the man who the Lord does not impute or count iniquity against him? There's a difference. There's a vast difference. Now, there were those who say, well, I have faith and I believe in God. I trust the Lord and I know he saved me. And yet they use that as a license to sin. And the apostle says that they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. We know these people. We've seen these people. There's nothing, there's nothing uh, spiritual about them. They live carnal, fleshly lives. On one hand, they say they're saved. And they say, well, once saved, always saved. Yet there is no fruit in their life. And the fruit is all important. So, justification consists of two elements. Forgiveness and removing of guilt. And this guilt can eat you up. And forgiveness is so important if you know how you're forgiven and based on what are you forgiven. What is it based on? Are you forgiven because of your good works? Are you forgiven because you mean well? Are you, are you, are you forgiven because you're dedicated? No. 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 No at all. Micah chapter number 7 verse 18 says this. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will subdue our iniquities and thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of the sea. Thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham, which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old. God wants to forgive us. But as long as you hide behind your righteousness, you'll never be forgiven. So you've got to define this. You've got, to, you've got to bring it out. You've got to, you have, I have to define what I'm talking about. It is Christ's righteousness. Before in the Old Testament, before in the Old Testament, God named three men, Noah, Job, and Daniel. Remember them in the book of Ezekiel. He used these three men to represent the highest point of righteousness that a human being could obtain because he judged their lives. And he judged Noah, he judged Job, and he judged Daniel. And I'll tell you right now, Noah, Job, and Daniel are heroes in my book. And I would no way ought to say anything despairingly about these men. They're wonderful men. But God said that even if I brought their righteousness before me and let it count for you, it would not deliver you from the judgment that's coming. Are you watching? Even if I brought these men, put them together, and used their righteousness, I could not deliver you because it cannot be done. So here's the bottom line. All of the Old Testament saints that lived up to the cross, every last one of them, they lived under the law, they persevered under the law, the law condemned them, the law was their schoolmaster, but the law never justified the first one. And the law could never make them righteous. If it can't justify you, it can't make you righteous. Now, a lady showed me a book the other day. I think she's lady sitting back here. A book in the, I looked at the, the cover of the back cover of it. And you can always tell when somebody is trying to drag something into grace. 
And they started going on about the law, about the law, about the law, about the law. So we're going to deal with that in just a moment. But I want you to get a hold of this simple truth tonight. Romans chapter number 3, verse 22. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, now watch this, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. I want to read that again. The righteousness of Jesus Christ by faith is unto all. In other words, it's offered to all. And it is upon all. Plain of words, you not only receive it, that becomes your righteousness. See what he's saying? And how, does it do, how, how do we do it? It is by faith. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ to all and upon all them that believe. Now I want to ask you a simple question tonight. Do you think that you could live, even if you lived a sinless, perfect life, would it match the righteousness of God? No. <laughs> Never come close. See? Even, a, even if you were the most dedicated, humble person that ever walked the face of this earth, and if possible, and it's not possible, but if possible, hypothetically, to live a sinless, perfect life, it'd be a, it would be a, <laughs> like a tar pit compared to the righteousness of God, right? Amen. So the only thing that can get you into heaven is the righteousness of God. Amen. Exactly. And the only way that you can have the righteousness of God is by faith. So what does that mean, preacher? You have to trust someone's word. You see, God's word is very important. When the rich man lifted up his eyes and hell and said, Let me go warn my five brethren. Send Lazarus, let me warn my five brethren, unless they come to this awful place of torment, right? What did Abraham say to him? They've got the word, right? They've got Moses and the prophets. If they will not hear them, neither will they hear one that has come back from the dead. God's word is an extension of God's character. To doubt his word is to doubt his character. To doubt his word is to call him a liar. That's essentially what you're doing. If God said it, you don't have to believe it for it to be finished. If God said it, that finishes it. When you believe it, then you reap the benefit of it. So when you come to faith, and we come to this issue of faith, the very first, most important point about faith is, I believe what God said. I believe it. If God said it, that's good enough. I believe it. He will not lie to you. So, you are made righteous and justified by believing what God said. Now that puts it within the reach of everybody. If you had to buy it, a lot of people couldn't afford it. If you had to do something, a lot of people couldn't do it. But if you simply accept God at His Word, then you put God's character on the line. And by doing that, that faith allows something to happen inside you. It allows life to come into you. That trust in God's Word allows something to be born in you. And once it's born in you, a lot of other things happen. But first there must be the birth. There must be the birth. It must take place. Now, I want you to notice how justification works. Romans chapter number 3, verse number 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, why would that change? And why would that principle change? From Genesis all the way until Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. From Genesis until that point, the only thing the law could ever do was give you the knowledge of sin. There is not one passage of Scripture anywhere to be found in the Old Testament, and I challenge all of these, these, uh, these people that's trying to drag the law into salvation, show me one place where it ever said the law ever saved anybody, or justified anybody, or made anybody righteous. The first man where the word righteousness shows up, it's Abraham. And Abraham looked up into the heavens and the Bible said he believed God. He believed him. He believed what God said. And it was accounted to him for righteousness. It comes back to the same principle that the Apostle Paul argues throughout the whole book of Romans. And that is righteousness comes by faith. And justification is by faith. Now you've got to remember, 
God puts some, uh, some uh, fail-safe, that's a good term to use, He puts some fail-safe things in the Scripture that relate to humanity to let you know whether you did believe God or not. But don't ever get that before the belief. Don't ever try to change something until God's done the changing on the inside. You're whitewashing a sepulcher then, and that's an issue. So he said that uh, in Romans 3.20, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now the law... As far as we're concerned, Galatians chapter number 3, verse 10, Paul said, For as many as of the works of the law are under the curse. Did you hear that? For it is written, Cursed is every one that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. All right, here's a simple question. Here's a question. Do you believe in your heart of hearts that anybody lived in the Old Testament? I'm talking about all of them. I'm talking about even Job and Daniel I'm talking about them. I'm talking about these men, Noah, Job, and Daniel. Did any man live in the Old Testament that kept the law verbatim to perfection? Anybody? Then they were under the curse of the law. I see this is why they hate Paul. Because the Apostle Paul not only lays out the accomplishment of Christ on the cross, he lays it in plain terminology, the burden of the law. He lays it out. He lays it out in plain terminology. So, the law demanded perfect obedience. And this is what's taken this brother's joy away from him, because he may have been listening to some, some Arminians and some people who are trying to tell him that, that, he has to, that to, to obey God is to serve the Lord, and by serving God and obeying God, then that uh, you're working, and that work is an evident sign that you love God, and you're going to work your way, and you're going to keep working, and keep working, and keep working. Until you get to heaven. So, Galatians chapter number 2, verse 16 says this. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law there shall no flesh be justified. Galatians 3.10. For as many as are of the works of the law, once again are under the curse. Romans 3.28 Therefore, we conclude that a man is justified by faith without the deeds of the law. Amen. Now, how many has ever seen an apple tree? You ever picked an apple from an apple tree? You know, we live in a generation that think milk's, milk comes from a store. I have no idea there's a cow involved. <clears throat> so an apple tree... It's a wonderful thing. Walk up, pull an apple off of it. We used to eat little green apples when I was a kid and get belly aches. You ever eat one of them and get a belly ache? <laughs> Been there, done that. And, uh, but the uh, apple tree, you take an apple off of it, and you ask yourself this question, where would that apple come from? It came off the tree, obviously, but where did it get its life? It got its life from the tree, right? From the inside of the tree, from the sap of the tree. From, from the depths of the tree, from, from what makes the tree the tree. The apple grew on that tree because that tree was alive. All right. To try to use your righteousness and your obedience and bring it before God and offer it up as something acceptable to Him is taking apples and trying to stick them on the tree. That's what you're trying to do. You're trying to take an apple and... Put it on the tree. God says, if you have believed what I said to believe, if you have trusted my word, an apple is going to come on that tree. It's going to grow on that tree. It's going to produce fruit on that tree. Now, the fruit of belief, not only is an apple using an analogy here, but the fruit of belief is repentance, obedience. Sure, you, be, you need to obey. The law, I love the law. The Ten Commandments are a wonderful thing. You go read the Ten Commandments. These people that argue the Ten Commandments, they're, they're, I've, I've yet to see one of them argue about thou shalt not kill. You know what they're arguing? The Sabbath day. That's the kicker. Anytime they start talking about the law and how the, the second two times removed and all of this, it's always the Sabbath day. It's about a day. The Apostle Paul said plainly in the book of Romans and the book of Colossians, if you esteem one day above another, you go right ahead. 
Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. But then he said in Colossians, Don't let any man judge you according to a holy day or the Sabbath days. Don't let him judge you to that. He says, you, he says in the book of Hebrews, chapter number 2, The Lord Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. He is our rest. And that's what the word rest means. Shabbat. It means a Sabbath. He's our Sabbath. So you can either have a day as a Sabbath or a person as a Sabbath. And how many times have I said that all of these Old Testament types and all of these Old Testament requirements all lead up to a person? Righteousness in the Old Testament is a person in the New Testament. Christ. He's the righteous one. So, you have to understand where they're coming from. They think that righteousness and justification is what they do. Righteousness and justification is who you believe in. And if you're doing it, and your righteousness is what you're doing, I'm going to tell you who you're believing in. You're believing in yourself. You're trusting yourself to hang on until you leave this world and go to heaven. That's right. And I'm going to tell you right now, no man can hang on and no man can do it. You'll never make it by hanging on. It won't work. So, justification, Romans chapter number 3, verse 24. Being justified freely by His grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. The apostle introduces the word grace. We're justified freely by His grace. Well, how hard do I have to work to get God's grace? Huh? It's free. If it's not free, it's not grace. For by works are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, the gift of God. Right. For by what? Grace are you saved through faith, not of yourself, the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. If it's not free, it's not grace. See what I mean? Now you can get into the definition of grace, and most folks say it's the unmerited favor of God. That's good. But the bottom line is that grace is the channel, the vehicle that allows God to reach in and touch you and do something with you, and there's no other way He could do it. For a holy God could never intervene in your life except through the me measure of grace. Because you'll never be good enough. You can never justify it. A holy God could never touch an unholy thing like us except through grace. And that's how He does it. He does it through grace. So he said, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Romans 5, 9, 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. Justified by grace and justified by the blood. Now what was justification? Justification is a legal declaration that as far as God is concerned, he didn't say you were perfect, but he said you are legally accepted, you are legally part of his body. That's what justification is. He counts you just. And the justification he counts you just on is the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. For now we're on the other side of the cross looking back at what's been accomplished on the tree. The Old Testament, they weren't there. In the Old Testament, a different situation entirely. This is why he said he died for the redemption of the transgressions under the First Testament when the Lord Jesus went to the tree. So the Bible tells us here he's justified by his blood. Verse 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he hath made him to be sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Now, a simple thing. Galatians 2, 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ, that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Amen. He contrasts in Galatians chapter number 3, him that believeth in Jesus with as many as are of the works of the law. He contrasts the two. It's like a lady holding the scales of justice, blindfolded. I'd like to find that somewhere. It's not in the world I've lived in. <laughs> but she's standing there blindfolded, and she's holding the scales of justice. And by, you know, nothing arbitrary about it. It is simply whichever side outweighs the other. 
It's that simple. It's that simple. Okay? Well, this is what the Apostle Paul has done. He has taken your works and grace and justification by faith on the other hand. And here's what he finds. He finds that this outweighs. This has substance to it. And all the rest of it is just a bunch of wasted garbage. And that's, that's all it is, folks. Uh, the uh, Romans chapter number 3, verse 26, the apostle said, To declare, I say at this time, His righteousness, that He might be just, and the justifier of Him which believeth in Jesus. Now that's a big statement. Here's what that statement means. A holy God cannot just dismiss the sin of the sinner and remain holy. No. He can't do it because the sin breaks the law of God. It must be accounted for. So he can't just dismiss it. He can't do that because he's holy. So what happens? Well, look at the text. To declare, I say at this time, his righteousness. We're going to declare his righteousness. We're going to let you... Understand the righteousness of God as it relates to men. Look at this. That he might be just, remain just in his relationship with us, and the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. How does he do that, preacher? He does that by taking your sin, your corruption, your rebellion, and puts it on someone else. This is why the Bible says he made him... To be sin for us who knew no sin. So you're going to pay for your sin. No, they've already been paid for. You pay for your sin, you go to hell. You're not paying for your sins. They've already been paid for. When Christ died at the cross, He paid for everybody's sins. Didn't He? Not just the elect. Well, what's happening, preacher? Sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. And hell is the second death. See the progression? That's what's happening. In other words, God rescues you from the inevitable result of sins, corruption, damnation, and destruction. He rescues from it. How does He do it? He remains just and He justifies you, but the way He does it is by taking someone who died a vicarious death in your place and puts it on Him. A type of that in the Old Testament is a scapegoat. When they put their hands on that goat, confessed the sins of the people, and led the, and led the goat away, and the goat went away into the wilderness, and it carried the sins of the people. Now that goat, you know, that goat, the blood of bulls and goats can't save them, can't cleanse them, but their faith in God's promise and what He told them to do does. And they did what they could do. That's all they knew to do. And by doing that, God justified them. So, the condition of justification, very simple. They justified because you can't do it. There's no way in the world that we could ever do it. So you mean, preacher, that it comes back down to the simple fact of faith? Yes, it does. Ask yourself a question now, not a simple question. Do you believe God? Let's start in square one. Do you believe His Word? Because I have a hard time with people who don't believe His Word and say, Oh, I believe God. I trust God. You know, the Bible. I was reading a thing the other night, and this guy was talking about the Apostle Paul. And I forget the context of it, but I get on these boards and I start reading their, their comments about certain passages of Scripture. And uh, he, was, he quoted the Apostle Paul, and here's what he said. He said it wasn't his finest hour in a statement that Paul made. I don't remember. I, wish, I, I should have written the text down, brought it to you, and let you read it. In plainer words, he was casting aspersion on the inspiration of the Scriptures when he said it wasn't Paul's finest hour. Who is this guy to judge Paul? You know, really, that's arrogance. Now let me say, he doesn't believe the Bible. He doesn't believe the Bible. He worships himself. And I'm sure he falls at the altar of his brain. For apparently he thinks he's so smart that he can pick up the written word of God and he can say, well, you know, that's not, uh, that's really not for us today. Uh, that's not really inspired. Uh, Paul had finer hours, and his understanding of uh, of the law was perverted because he was a he was not only a Pharisee, he was a Pharisee, but he was a Greek also in the sense that he was raised under Greek influence. He was a Jew, folks, but I'm talking about he was a cosmopolitan Jew. 
The Apostle Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. He was an educated Jew, but he was educated in the, in the, in the cultures of his world and of his day. He wasn't limited just to Judah or Judea or Jerusalem. The Apostle Paul was cosmopolitan. In plain words, many different cities. That's what the word means. In a world of cities. That's the, that's the literal meaning of cosmopolitan. Cosmos is world, politan is many. So he is, he is a citizen of many different cities. And that's, uh, that's what's going on here. I don't believe that. Well, I mean, I understand that, I, but like I say, certainly he is educated. Compare him to the Apostle Peter. Peter's a fisherman. But does it change the inspiration of the Scripture? Every word that Peter wrote was not written by, the, by a perspective of an uneducated fisherman. It is written by the perspective of an inspired apostle. Same with Paul. Every word Paul wrote was written by the, by, under the perspective of an inspired po apostle. That's what I'm, now you believe the Bible. I believe the Bible. I do believe the Bible. I really do believe the Bible. I do believe it. And like Samuel Clemens said, it's not the parts of the Bible that I don't understand that bother me. It's the parts of the Bible I do understand that bother me. <laughs> because I don't understand all the Bible. I don't. I really don't. I don't understand all of it. But I believe it. And when God's character is on the line... I'm going to put my trust in His character every time. If God's name and God's word and His promise is given to me and to you, I'm going to embrace it. I'm going to receive it. And if I come down here and get on my knees and say, Lord, God, have mercy on me, a sinner, and save me, cleanse me of my sins. My soul is eaten up. I've got a burden I can't carry. I know I'm condemned to hell. God, help me. God said, for whosoever shall call in the name of the Lord shall be saved. I want you to emphasize whosoever on that one. That's what that, emphasize that part of it. Whosoever calleth upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You do that. You believe it. You believe God's promise. You take him at his word. You receive him into your soul. You receive his word. You receive it by faith. Then by faith, God will justify you. And impute righteousness to you, and he'll save you. Yes, and write your name, the book of life. Yes. I had no trouble with that when I bowed my head on that sofa in 1973. It was as simple as it could be to me, because I'd never done it before. I bowed my head and I said, Lord, have mercy on my soul and save me. And when I raised my head back up, I was in another world. Yes. Just that fast. Everything had changed, and I knew it. I knew it at that moment. I knew somebody had moved into me as a lot greater than me, and everything changed. Amen. Hallelujah to God. Now, your, you know, your salvation experience might be a little different. We're all saved by the same God and the same Savior. Amen. And so you don't, have to, you don't have to compare yourself with somebody else. Just ask yourself in your soul, do you believe the Lord?